Welcome to episode eight of the actual astronomy podcast, the podcast where we actually talk about astronomy. How odd. Okay, Shane. So um, this is our second podcast in the uh, in the set that we're doing today while we're uh, sitting here in uh, in isolation. And I referenced in the last one that I bought two new books. Now I'm more of a book buyer, I think, than you. You're the you're kind of the gear the gearhead. And I'm a little bit more of the uh, of the uh, library. Uh, yeah, yeah. You bring the knowledge, and uh, I don't know. I don't bring much, really. But <laughs> <laughs> you bring you bring more than you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. So so um, I go to the uh, skymaps.com uh, when I'm teaching my class. And this is a, a great website for people who are getting into astronomy and it really kind of, there's, there's a free chart that you can download and they actually advertise uh, a few other things. And now we're not sponsored by them or anything. I think it's just a great website, but kind of how they make their money is they, they'll sell like books and stuff. And one of the ones they were recommending was this, uh, it's called the Sky Atlas, the greatest maps, myths, and discoveries of the universe. And I thought, man, that sounds really cool. So I'm going to buy that book. So I, I like clicked on the link or whatever takes me through to Amazon. Then I sort of did the futzing around because we're in Canada, we're not in America. So I don't know if they're going to get the the one dollar kickback or whatever they get to to the website or not. But uh, but anyway, so I'm picking that up because it just sent it, and they had this really interesting, very um, almost, well, it is certainly patriotic, like American, uh, advertisement for it with, uh, Kennedy giving this speech. And then it goes into, uh, some detail on the book and anyway, looked, uh, looked pretty interesting. And then, um, we're going to talk about Venus today. And I was looking at some drawings, um, that Paul Abel or Abel, I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it. Who's a UK astronomer. I think he used to be on, uh, the Patrick Moore, uh, series, Sky at Night. Um, but anyway, he uh, has a book on visual astronomy. It is called Visual Lunar and Planetary Astronomy. And, um, and his drawings are phenomenal. I think he's like head of the um, Venus and lunar section for one of the big astronomy organizations over, over in the UK. And um, his drawings just were amazing. So I was like, I, I got to buy this guy's book. You know, I've got a lot of the Peter Grago books, but uh, unfortunately, since his passing, there won't be any more of those coming out. So I thought this this looked pretty interesting. Oh, so, that sounds really neat. Yeah, so that's kind of kind of what I've uh, got in the pipeline. Like I said, I still need to, you know, I keep thinking, I, I kind of wish. So I was going to do an unboxing when I got that diagonal. And then when I did unbox it and it, and it was not what I was expecting, I really wish I had filmed that now because I feel like that would have been amazing, right? Because I've kind of gone from, paying you know it was two hundred dollars or close to it to get this diagonal i didn't get what i had ordered i got this and you know i've been doing astronomy for a long time i know what a diagonal looks like and it didn't look like a diagonal right so i pull it out and i'm like what is this my wife's like what yeah what is that like i know what a diagonal looks like you order a diagonal that's not a diagonal like it's like two-thirds of a diagonal i'm like yeah well i got two-thirds off or one-third off or something so anyway that would have been pretty good. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to say this. In this episode, I'm actually going to talk about crushing a Teleview Plossel in a vice while Shane cringes in awkward silence. <laughs> oh, I wasn't so this, expecting that. <laughs> so this spring, uh, we've been buying some new equipment. And, and why is that, Shane? Why, why, why would this be a time when two oh. people are buying equipment? <laughs> You know, because we have too much time on our hands in isolation. Uh, and I, you know, at least speaking for myself, I'm spending far too much time looking at online, you know, equipment and ads. But more, more, or probably a, a better reason is um, we have a, a really a nice planetary season coming our way. Um, yes. Where Mars, uh, Jupiter, and Saturn will be all in the sky around the same time. Uh, later this summer or spring and well I guess they're in the sky already in the early morning but you know at uh, kind of normal observing hours they'll be a little later in the year and uh, it's not often all three are in the sky at the same time and those are the three planets that really draw amateur astronomers because those are the three that show a lot of detail or have the potential to show a lot of detail and they're coming up like like in the past uh, few years 
they were in the lower part of the ecliptic, uh, right around into Scorpius and Ophiuchus and Sagittarius. So, so now they're coming up, right? And so I think even, um, I'm not sure if Mars is crossing the, I think it crosses the um, ecliptic. I don't think it crosses the celestial equator until, until after uh, its opposition date, which is October 13th, I believe. But um, they're getting higher. For sure, they're getting, getting higher during, during this time. And so they're kind of, in a way, going to be, especially Mars is going to be at its optimal height per temperature in Saskatchewan ratio, right? Where it's yeah. going to be about as high as it can be, where it's good to view it while the temperature uh, is still uh, going to be hopefully above zero or not much below zero in, in the evening. So that yeah. should be good. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the reasons why we like uh, to observe things when it's higher in the sky is because you're looking through less atmosphere, the higher things are in the sky. And one of the limiting factors or the limiting factor when viewing the planets is what we refer to as seeing. And seeing in amateur astronomy terms is really describing how settled or how stable the Earth's atmosphere is or the various layers of that. And um, if, if it's higher in the sky, you're looking through less layers and you're more likely to have a good view of a planet. So this, we're towards the end of, uh, I think, the third week of April now, or I guess maybe in the middle of the third week, whatever. Um, and I was out last night observing. I think you were as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, what did yes. you think of the? What did you think of the seeing last night? Um, you know what? I wasn't out last night. It was two nights ago. Two it nights was, ago. Uh, it was too windy for me, and I couldn't get out of it in my backyard. So. Yeah, last night garbage seeing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I looked up and it was and it had cleared there was some some high cloud moving around and and I've been out I think the past three or four nights I've gotten quite a few nights in and uh and the night before last was awesome it was really really good on Friday night and and then I couldn't resist and I was saying to my my wife I said I don't think the seeing is that good though it's I could see the stars are really pulsing and uh I just couldn't resist I went out and I've, I've actually been keeping my telescope like locked, like it's, it's in a locked building, in a locked vehicle, but it's unheated. So even if it's like minus two or minus three out, my telescope is plus two, plus three, it's like pretty much cooled. Take it out, point it, and yeah, it was, the seeing last night was just absolute garbage. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's often the case when, you know, it's breezy outside or, you know, if a, if a system just passes through, sometimes we're left with crappy skies. Yeah, it was. It wasn't breezy at ground level. Like I, I think it was the most still it's been in in uh, in weeks in in the evening. Like the day was windy, mm -hmm. and, and like I live actually, I think you and I live as far apart in our city as we can live. And our city is, I think, it's one of the largest cities per capita density in North America, or something. Like it's a really big city for the number of people that live in it. So I think, I think we actually live like 15 or 25 kilometers apart or some ridiculous number like that, even <laughs> though our city is only like hardly 200,000 people, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we do live in opposite corners. So, so you can actually sometimes have slightly different weather uh, than I do, you know, just, just depends on, on how it goes. But um, it's amazing, you know, to be watching, especially night to night tonight, like, like I've been the past uh, several nights. And, you know, back in March, we were seeing that it was nearly like a full planet, like, you know, it looked like a, like almost like a full moon, right? Like it was just, just off of full. And then now like night to night, it's just getting more and more uh, thinner and thinner. And, you know, it's really very much a, a crescent phase at this time, eh? Yeah. And, and it never ceases to surprise me um, how bright Venus is when only 30% of it is really illuminated. Um, it, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. And it's also like, it's one thing I'm having a little bit trouble getting my head around. I guess it must be like the angle and the inclination and all that, but like I would have thought, you know, and I've never really observed Venus recently. Like it's been a few years. Like I used to observe it on a more casual basis. Um, and then once I thought I saw clouds and then I got into this big debate with myself and, others about whether I saw these clouds or not. And then kind of after that, I kind of got frustrated, didn't observe Venus for about six years there. But, uh, and we'll talk more about the clouds in a moment, but um, 
you know, it's really strange to think about how much of a crescent it can be and still be so high up, right? Like, it really hasn't changed position that much in the nighttime sky. Like, you know, it's still pretty much as high, like it's kind of shifting sort of, uh, you know, south to north more than anything, then then getting lower and lower in the evening sky. I thought by now, by this phase, it would be behind the, the houses um, that I have to observe over. But it's still plenty high, even, you know, I can see it uh, even almost towards midnight still. So pretty surprising. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really prime, prime observing for Venus right now, I think. Yeah. So there's, there's a few things that, uh, that we've kind of been noticing. We've, uh, you know, we talked about the clouds in one of the other episodes, and we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, as well. And you've made uh, an interesting observation, I think. And then I think maybe we'll, we'll talk about the ashen light as well. So back on the 25th, I, I went out and set my telescope up and 60 millimeter F10 and boom, I could see the clouds, no problem. <laughs> like, and then I was really surprised because as I, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, I, I thought I had seen them before my five inch refractor and I really debated with myself whether I saw those clouds or not. And it turns out that I think that I had the best seeing conditions for actually standing good, good chance of seeing them in March. And then I think uh, the phase that was at being, uh, a, you know, just about a full or about as full as Venus can be for being so high up in the sky uh, was sort of optimal for, for seeing the clouds. And I think that night, if anybody had come look through my telescope, I think anybody would have seen them. They were that apparent and not just dark clouds. I could see, uh, dark clouds, I can see bright clouds, um, and, and all kinds of different things. But you, uh, as well, you saw the clouds, uh, I think in 2015, you sent me an observation the other day. Yeah, yeah. In 20, like, Venus is one of those planets uh, that I've never spent much time observing. Um, because everything I've read tells me that there's not a lot to see other than kind of the phases of Venus. Uh, Venus is covered in clouds, so there's really no surface detail that you can observe. Um, so really I didn't spend much time ever looking at it. And then five years ago, uh, in May, um, I had my 120 millimeter Skywatcher ED refractor out and it was, a it was an average night of seeing, um, here in Saskatchewan. Like it was, uh, you know, maybe a three and a half out of five, which is, um, you know, fairly common for us in, at that time of the year. Um, please, please, Shane, we only use the uh, Antoniadi scale here, you know, we're not going to. Oh, I'm just oh. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Robert's rules of order. Is that, is that next? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, but anyway, I was looking at Venus and um, I was using about a hundred times magnification. And I noticed um, like a, an inconsistency in the clouds. And it was a darker region that was near the Terminator. So the Terminator is the the line where the brightness of the planet goes into darkness, um, where the shadow begins. And um, yeah, it, it, there was a very noticeable darkening in that area. And what was interesting, so maybe I'll also throw in, you know, when, when you're at the eyepiece, um, especially looking for subtle details and characteristics of, of anything that you're looking at, um, you have to kind of ask yourself, am I really seeing what I think I'm seeing? Or is my brain trying to tell me I'm seeing something. And uh, the way you can overcome that is, you know, observe the same thing multiple times, uh, maybe use different magnifications, you, you know, try to change up the, uh, the, the way you're looking at it. And if you're consistently seeing the same feature or the same color, then you can, you know, you can safely be assured that you saw it. I've, I've also got all kinds of really great philosophy books on human perception, if you're ever interested. They, yeah, yeah. Well, that's exactly it, right? That's yeah. the, the, whole, the whole point of this. Um, but that night, I had my brother uh, over, and he was observing with me as well. And my brother has looked through a telescope four or five times in his life. Uh, he's not an amateur astronomer, um, but he does enjoy to have the occasional look when he's around, and I have a telescope out. So he looked through... Uh, my telescope at Venus. And I asked him, I didn't tell him what I saw, but I asked him, you know, what are you seeing? And he described the exact same thing that there's sort of a dark area in the middle, uh, you know, by the Terminator. And uh, so I went to cloudy nights and I started a thread about, you know, did I actually see cloud detail? 
And that's when it became known to me for the first time that, yeah, you know, other people have seen it as well. Um, it seems to be a very fleeting observation. You know, just because you see cloud one night doesn't mean you're going to see it the next night. Yeah. And um, that kind of kicked it off for me. Yeah. And, that, yeah. It's, that's pretty interesting, you know. And like at first, like I really doubted myself as well, like when I saw it. And I guess it was, it was after I moved here. Now, you know, and I'm, I, I moved here from out east. Now, out east, you're, you're down lower, especially where I'm from, you're really near the ocean and end that, uh, that marine layer. I, I don't think you could see cloud features on Venus through that layer. I think you would need very particular conditions in, in, uh, in the Maritimes from, from to be able to see that. But out here, you know, we're up, you know, the lowest point in our city is like 2,000 feet above sea level. And, uh, you know, uh, you can get really tremendous dry and clear conditions here, uh, you know, in this area. And when I, when I saw it that night, we were, we were observing out, um, I think we we're about 40 or 50 kilometers uh, south uh, east of the city and looking over like fields, like beautiful flat fields for, you know, hundreds of miles and, you know, really great seeing conditions. And I thought I kind of like you, I kind of thought, Hmm, I see something in the middle, but I kept thinking at, even at the time that it's like, somehow it's like the cusps of, of the planet that are playing a trick on the eye and like, like, cause maybe they're like diverging or something like that. And I, I was pretty certain that night that I saw it, but then over time, I, I really began to doubt myself. And after, after some time, and I didn't get another chance during that apparition to, to take a peek again, but I really convinced myself that I hadn't seen it um until here in march you know and this was i think uh, uh, at least a six-year gap and but here in march i set up my scope and like you it was just the right day the right night kind of thing and you know you could really see you can really see those clouds so um i've got this this good book on venus and mercury and how to uh, how to observe them do you have any of these how to observe them books by springer no i don't they're they're decent. Uh, some are better than others, and uh, the ones by Peter Grago are are really good. Although if if you own more than one, I think kind of goes over some of the same material, but like telescopes and filters and stuff like that. So you know you kind of get some of the same material, but they're they're a good size. Um, and in this book, and Peter Grago was a UK uh, visual observer, uh, died in 2016, but he uh, he's got some good sketches and some good detail, and he talks about. Um, this sort of Y or V shaped, as I put it, um, pattern, that's like a horizontal Y or a V. Um, and that's what I was drawing and talking with you about. And then I've had this book for a long time and then I just grabbed it. And I, I hadn't fully read the book and, uh, and was, was reading about this. And I was like, wow, yeah, that's like pretty much, I think what I described to you just, you know, a few days ago so that, that that's what I was uh, able to pull out of this cloud deck anyway. Yeah. And, and when you sent me that email about your observation of, of the Venus clouds, the next night I, I took out my telemeter, my little 63 millimeter refractor, uh, to see if I could uh, pull out any of the cloud detail. And um, I had another very memorable observation, I guess, of Venus that'll probably last with me, you know, the rest of my life. Yeah. Like, so what did you see? Cause you sort of noticed something that I hadn't quite noticed, or I, I hadn't noticed it in the same way as you. Yeah, so I was searching for the cloud. And um, as I was observing, you know, I can't confidently say that I saw the cloud features that night. I felt like there was a little darkening, but seeing was kind of off. So there'd be real brief moments where the seeing would kind of tighten up and, and, and you know, improve. And I think I saw the cloud, but this is one of those situations where is that my brain just kind of trying to convince me I'm seeing it or am I, am I really able to pull that detail in? So I wasn't able to confirm the cloud, but as I was observing it, it, the, the terminator. So again, that's that dark area where, you know, the, the brightness of the planet transitions to the shadow or darkness. Um, when you're looking at a moon, like a crescent moon, that terminator line is is uh, you know beautifully rounded and it's very consistent all the way through, um, but on Venus, it just it wasn't it was jagged it wasn't consistent, and at first I thought oh it's just the seeing or maybe an eyepiece aberration, 
but then I, I changed eyepieces, I, you know, which changes the magnification. And I ended up observing Venus for just over an hour, I'd say maybe an hour and 15 minutes. And during that entire time, this jaggedness uh, was kind of on the southern part of the Terminator. Yeah. It didn't disappear. So it wasn't seeing, it wasn't an eyepiece aberration. I thought the only other explanation here, well, two, uh, two explanations. One, I'm actually seeing something uh, that, or observing something strange in that Terminator. Um, or I, uh, I have an aberration inside the telescope. Um, so anyway, I sent you an email about my observation and then did a little bit of research and this inconsistent Terminator line, uh, has been observed as far back as the 1600s, which is yeah. news to me. Um, and, and, you know, what I like about those types of observations is when you have no knowledge of it existing, you really, in my opinion, you really know that you saw it then. Because there's no way your brain is trying to, again, kind of convince you you're seeing something because you didn't, you didn't know it existed. And yeah. to kind of have a personal discovery like that mm -hmm. is uh, very memorable. Yeah, I suppose it could be some sort of illusion or some sort of illusionary phenomenon. But I, yeah, I don't think so, though. So, like, I've been noticing, like, again, I didn't think of it as jagged. Just I can actually see, like, a pretty good cut um like about two-thirds the way up from say like the equator um on the south side where you said and and that night that you were out um it was really i thought it was pretty dark like it was a pretty dark cut and then i observed that over a few nights and then last night even though the seeing wasn't that good the only feature that i could see was that cut although it didn't seem as uh, prominent but there was a cut on the northern side as well and then on the on the other side of those cuts it's really bright. And then when I actually went and looked at, uh, I didn't know if it was like an optical phenomena or what, but when I, when I went and looked at like recent uh, photographs that people have been taking of Venus, you can actually see that, you know, if they're using a UV filter or something like that, they're actually pulling out that there are, you know, these bright, uh, you know, they're not polar cats, but they're polar hoods or cloud hoods over the planet uh, in those areas. So, you know, kind of you tell me, like, either I'm having a, uh, I'm seeing an illusion that is coincidental with actually what's happening on the planet. But I mean, essentially, anything that we experience visually, I uh, could be chalked up to that anyway. So, <laughs> so it makes, yeah, makes yeah, That's it's a very interesting observation. Uh, you know, both, both observations are, are very interesting. And I don't know, have you had a chance to research, uh, like, explanations or, or what would cause some of uh, the unevenness in the Terminator? Well, you sent some links and I, I hadn't really looked at it that much because I, I, I didn't really think about it as like an uneven. I'm, I'm, I guess, now under more of the assumption, especially after my experience in March, that um, like for sure in March, I was seeing clouds like there's like it was they were just plain as day almost. Um, it wasn't a stretch like I, I set the telescope up. It had cooled. And then I kind of had tooled around a bit and then pointed at Venus and I just, I could just see them, right? I looked at them for like an hour, um, no problem. Then when I went out on subsequent nights, I had more trouble. And then as, as, the, uh, as the planet uh, disk has been thinning and turning more into a crescent, it's, it's been more of a challenge. So it could possibly be that before when I was looking, I was never looking at it in, uh, in such a full phase. And, and that's uh, perhaps what's needed to, to see the banding, right? Because um, one thing, and I'm thinking about this now, but it's the same with Venus, it is in Jupiter. You've probably noticed this as well, but kind of when you get on to, towards the limb, like maybe the last 10 or 15% or so, there's, there's a dimming effect that takes place. Like, you know, when you, if you're watching the great red spot come around the limb, like you often won't see it right away. And it seems like it's one of those things like, am I seeing it? Am I not seeing it? And then finally, it once it gets to about, you know, close to about 20 or like a fifth of the way around the, the, the limb into view, then you, you're like, oh, like that's it. Like suddenly it seems like you can really see it. And if you look at uh, photographs, like uh, ground-based photographs of Jupiter, you'll see that dimming. But it's the same with Venus. So if you think about that, um, like any planet is going to present in this, in this fashion. Um, you know, the less disc that you have to look at, there's, there's less of that sweet spot zone to really uh, make an observation of clouds. You know, by the time it gets to be a really thin uh, disc, it's going to, you might be able to see them, but it's going to be pretty challenging at that point, right? 
Yeah, for sure. For but sure. but so what did you find out in your research of this of this Terminator phenomenon? Well, it, it started off in like in the 1600s being explained as um, mountains on the surface of Venus just causing some unevenness there. Um, and that's before astronomers knew that the planet was, you know, cloud, clouded over completely and there's no way you could ever uh, see, you know, mountain features or anything like that. Um, so I, I still need to do some more research to find out what could cause that and um, if it's been proven out or if there's a, an answer to that question. I, I don't know that right now, but I do have to, I'm very curious. I need to do some reading. Yeah, and and like I said, I, I briefly read some of the stuff that you that you sent me, but uh, I mean, I think I kind of have the answer in in my own mind, even with without doing research, and that's that you can you can see these dark bits in the uh, in the cloud deck, and kind of as they pass over the Terminator, um, the the point where you know you kind of go from the daytime to the nighttime side of Venus, um, that you're going to get. Uh, inconsistencies in that and because you're looking down that sort of central meridian line um, that that's where they're going to be more apparent right I mean that's just that's mm -hmm. just the nature of it so I think just logically it it actually makes sense I had noticed them and I had noticed them where you noticed them so I mean if it's some sort of illusion it's it's a very consistent illusion amongst observers and uh, and I don't I don't think it is an illusion based on my previous observations in, in March. And I just think that's that's what we're seeing there. But you know, it's one of these strange things, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. But the uh, like the photographs of Venus, I think it's a very difficult object to photograph because it's so bright, yet it has that darker side, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. like it's like trying to photograph the moon. Um, when it's not full it yeah know, does present some challenges and it's small it's it's almost like trying to photograph like a like a zoomed in piece of a car on a sunny day and the one piece that you're photographing is like where the sun is glinting off of but then you also want to get detail um right next to that and it's it's really going to be hard i think i'm not a, a photographer you know way more about that stuff than i do but i feel like it, it would be very difficult to make that adjustment and when i look at the photos you know, I mean, when, when we're looking at Venus through the telescope, it's extremely bright. Um, but yet our range is, is broad with the human eye. So, you know, we're able to go from both looking at the very bright portion to the, uh, to sort of, sort of the dark side there. So do you have any, do you, ever, do you have anything else to add on the, on the Terminator phenomenon that you've noticed? Well, just that it's really that and the cloud features really have sparked an interest in Venus now for me. Um, again, like I said earlier on, I've never considered it to really be an object or a target that I want to look at just because the assumption has been there's not a lot to see there. Right. Um, you know, if I'm going to look at a solar system object, it will be the moon or Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. That's it. Yeah. Um, but now that we've seen some of this stuff on Venus, um, I just kind of think it might be one of the more challenging planets to actually pull detail out of. And therefore, I think it warrants a lot more time at the eyepiece. And uh, I'm kind of motivated now to get out and, and log a lot of time uh, at Venus, um, especially from the backyard at this time of the year when there's not a lot of other things in the sky to look at. Um, you know, I really want to see what there is um, to observe. And then also, uh, I want to try a bunch of filters. Um, when I posted that um, observation on cloudy nights five years ago, uh, some of the respondents indicated, you know, that they use the, the colored ratten filters, which is not unexpected. Uh, you know, yellow was common in terms of color, uh, red or orange, like number 21, I think. And then some people use blues and greens as well. But what really surprised me was a number of uh, amateur astronomers that use a O3 or an oxygen three filter on Venus, which is really odd. I never would have thought to use one Yeah, I, because that filter is used for nebulas, not planets. Yeah, I've never used it on, uh, on Venus, uh, to be honest, but I have, have used the nebula filters on Jupiter with some success. Interesting. But I think the Lumicon ones are maybe better because mine is not a Lumicon. It's uh, it's it's a, just a generic filter by one of the large, I, I think they're just all made by the same company. It's good as far as a filter goes, but I think it's, um, the glass isn't as good as the Lumicon glass. And I have some Lumicon filters, just not nebula filters. And those, uh, 
those definitely provide like a noticeable improvement. And I think what happens when I look at Jupiter with my, uh, with my O3 filter is it kind of breaks up the spectrum a bit almost. So it almost seems like really bad chromatic aberration in a way. So it's not, it's not a pleasing view, but with, with the Lumicon filter, we noticed that uh, it didn't do that. And it was, it was still really sharp and you get a really good view of the, uh, of the bands and everything. So I think you'll have lots to look forward to when you get that filter. Yeah, I have one in inch and a quarter that I could use right now. Um, but uh, I'm also excited for the Takahashi to arrive and start using that on Venus. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. So you're going to you know, have, have that nice scope. I, I was thinking last night when I was uh, pulling my 60 millimeter in and out that, wow, it would, it would be amazing to have that because I, I don't even know that it's a pound heavier than my 60 and uh, certainly uh, another 60 millimeters or the better part of an inch would would probably put it over over the top. Like I noticed my floaters get pretty bad. I use 127 magnification in the 60 quite a bit and my floaters are getting pretty bad at that point. But when I'm down at, at 85, I don't notice them. And even up to about 100, they're, I see them, but it's not a big deal. But uh, I think with the, with the 76, you can add about... Uh, you know, another 20 or 30 magnification onto that. Shouldn't be a problem there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited for it. Cool. Excellent. So the other thing uh, that I've, <laughs> that I've quote unquote noticed is something a little bit controversial and that's that ash and light phenomenon. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. Not, not really. Um, I, 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 it was referenced in that cloudy nights thread that I posted five years ago, but I, yeah, I'm not really too familiar with it. Why don't you tell us about it? So this was first noticed. Uh, and I, I looked this up before I did, I did research for this, uh, for this part. Um, first noticed by an Italian astronomer named Ricoli in 1643. And, uh, what that individual noticed was a weak illumination of the clouds on the unlit side, the unlit side of Venus. So we have the very bright portion, the bright crescent, and then the unlit side. And uh, it's most often observed when Venus is in the evening sky. And uh, that's because the evening terminator apparently of Venus is pointed towards the Earth. Uh, however, it's not been proven scientifically. And so in 2007, uh, the Venus Express planetary probe uh, returns some evidence of lightning. The Keck Observatory has uh, seen some sort of uh, what I call like an air glow phenomenon, like a green cast to, to the cloud deck, but th these kind of seem unlikely. I feel like lightning would be very transient. I feel like air glow, I mean, air glow on Earth is hard to see, and I feel like, uh, you know, that's not it. Um, and then it's also been observed by William Herschel and Patrick Moore. Um, and Peter Grago in, in this book on uh, Venus and Mercury and how to observe them, um, he actually talks about it pretty, pretty much as a fact that, uh, that this can be seen and, uh, and he's certainly seen it. And there's people on cloudy nights that, uh, that they go back and forth. They mention how it's controversial and that. But I really feel like, you know, from time to time that I can, that, that I get that sense. And I feel like it should be visible because, you know, like when, when we first saw Venus uh, in the transit of Venus, like I was able to see it once I kind of had it figured out where it was. Okay. So what happened was back in, what was it? 2012? Uh, yeah. I can't was, remember. Yeah. It was 2012. I think that we had the transit of Venus, the second of the, of the set. And as Venus was coming in, you know, there's some really big filaments in that that come off and through a hydrogen alpha filter, you could actually see Venus um, before it entered onto the disc because you could see it cutting across like one of these big filaments. And so I was waiting for it in my white light telescope, my five inch, I had it stopped down to like two inches or something. And uh, I just had a white light filter and I went and looked through um, another observer's hydrogen alpha. And then I came back to my telescope and I could actually see it once I came back before it entered the disc, which was really exciting. And then I could actually see the filament even in my, in my white light. And it turns out that some people are more uh, sensitive to this wavelength of light, which I must be somewhat more sensitive to because um, those that tend to be able to, to see such a phenomena will uh, perhaps be able to see the ash and light as well. And I feel like when I look at Venus, 
I'm looking at the bright part, but if I kind of focus my attention, almost like a vertivision vision on mm -hmm. the dark part, um, I can actually notice even just a tonal change. Like I'm not really sure if what I'm seeing is the ashen light so much as just a tonal change between the background of space uh, and the disk of Venus. Like it's, it's very large, as you know, um, it's pretty close to us. And uh, I think that I feel like I'm able to see that disk. And then from time to time, I almost feel like I can see a little bit of light, like on the edge of the disc. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it, it certainly feels that way. Even last night, I had a few brief glimpses. The night before, I really had a good view of it. And a couple nights before that, it was, it was somewhat visible as well. So I don't know. It seems like when the seeing and the conditions are really good, I can see it more than when the seeing conditions aren't, which makes me feel like it's it's a real phenomena of some sort but um you can't actually see uh images of this but i don't know shane like as you know more about ask the astrophotography side of things than i do like would that just be because the planet is so bright that you know by the time they tune down the the brightness of the planet um you know to to a photographic level um that dark side is just going to be merged with the with the background of space or what I don't know. Well, I would think so. Like, you know, typically to not overexpose the bright side. Yeah. You'd have the dark side so dark that it, you know, it wouldn't, a, a, a slight increase in light on that side would not be detectable. But if you said that you saw it during the transit using a white light filter, like that white light filter blocks like 99.9% .9 of all light. Uh, or something, right? It's a high percentage. Yeah, yeah, sure. But what I'm seeing there is I'm seeing that, and this is the debate in my mind. Okay, maybe I should be more clear. Is am I am I seeing the disk of Venus against the background of space? Okay, that's kind of in a way what I think I'm seeing. Or or is it the weakly illuminated dark side of Venus that I'm actually detecting? Do you see what I'm like? There's a yeah. difference there, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure. I I feel like it's one or the other. Like you know, it's, it's one or the other. I'd, I'd have to convince myself that I was seeing some sort of light. It's just like, yeah, I, I don't know about that. Almost like an earth shine type event, but uh, you know, but of course on, on a much smaller and, and further scale. Well, and you know, it's interesting that you bring up earth shine. Um, so earth shine, when you're looking at a moon at, at our moon, when it's um, through any of its phases, there's the dark, there's the dark part of the moon that is in shadow um, sometimes that dark area is a little bit brighter and we call that earth shine because there's, there's sunlight being reflected off the earth. That's actually providing a little bit of light on the moon. So it, it appears a little bit brighter than usual. Um, but because Venus is so reflective with its clouds, um, you know, I would assume anyway that, you know, any stray light out there, uh, is going to be more reflected than what our moon does. Yeah. And that's one thing I was thinking of is like, why couldn't it be that, you know, like as, as the sun has sort of set on one portion that that light is just kind of coming through the clouds, just like how we have a sunset here. And if there's clouds, you know, like whole sky can be red, right? If it's completely clear and we've had nights here, like nights I've never seen before where it's super dry, super clear, and the sun goes down, it's like someone just threw a switch and it's dark almost like right away. Like you've probably seen that as well here, especially like, you know, at the end of summer, we often will get that when the, when the inclination of, of the sunset is just right. And there's nothing in the atmosphere. It's just, we haven't had rain in days, but there's, there's uh, no harvest going on yet. And then it's been very dry um, and just like the right kind of temperature and everything and no clouds and not many planes. Um, and then boom, like, once that sun goes down, it really just gets dark very, very quickly. So yeah, I wonder if, if that's what it is, is that when we have so many clouds in the sky and we have tons of clouds in the sky, then the sun goes down and then it's like, you know, they get illuminated all over the sky, right? And I'm wondering if that's just happening um, almost on like a planetary level of some, of some sort. And depending on the types of clouds and the different heights and everything like that, you might get uh, something like that. Like you said, it's so bright, like the photons can just kind of be bouncing around and creating like different pockets and inconsistencies. And it's so, so faint and fleeting and transient that, you know, that, that seems like it would be a very faint fleeting and transient type of event. 
but to be honest, I haven't noticed that. Like I haven't noticed, like I've seen some drawings where people are drawing like different shading on that disc and that's not what I'm seeing. I'm just seeing it more as a, as a different uh, tone of disc, um, you know, in front of the blackness of space. So whether it's just my eye evening that out, I don't know. Hmm. Very interesting, but you know, again, it, it just piques my interest in, in observing Venus. There's the, the obvious thing to observe, which is just the different phases, but you know, we now have clouds that we can try to see um, this inconsistent terminator, uh, whatever is causing that, um, you know, that's another thing to try to tease out of the, the detail. And then this strange, you know, sort of lighting or whatever we want to call it, the ashen light on the, the dark part of Venus. Um, you know, uh, I'm excited to see how many times I can pull this stuff in or if I can pull all of this stuff in. So one way they say that people could maybe more definitively try to determine if this ashen light business is a real event, like a real observable thing or not, is to use an occulting eyepiece. Okay, oh, do you yes. know what this is? Yes, yes. Do you, you have, have one? No, do you have one? I do not. And do you know why that is? Because they don't make them. <laughs> they don't, yes, they don't make them. This is, this is ridiculous. So, so you can look up instructions. And so uh, after I'd bought some wide field eyepieces and I still had my 32 millimeter plossel, I thought I'm going to turn it into my occulting eyepiece because this is kind of what uh, some of the sources recommend. I think Sky and Telescope had had some articles on this. And they were online or whatever. So my friend Tim, he owned, uh, he ran a motorcycle um, repair shop, basically. Okay. So I said, Tim, let's make an occulting eyepiece. And he was all for it. He's like, Yeah, I, you know, I'd use it. I, you know, you can use it for all kinds of different things. We were at the time trying to see the uh, the moons of Mars, right? You, that's what you have to do. And so we got the instructions and everything great. So I get the eyepiece and I get it up to his shop and and we go to unscrew it because you kind of have to put it into the like the field stop area. Like it has to be the bar. You can make the bar out of tape or a piece of aluminum or something like that or some sort of pin or whatever, but it has to go into um, a spot in the eyepiece, which is going to come to focus with the eyepiece, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a way to figure that out. I can't remember what it is, but anyway, so we're all set to do this. So we go to take the eyepiece apart and man, we can't get it apart. We need to kind of, you know, uh, get a good grip on. I try it, he tries it. So, so I take it and I put it in a vice and, and we're actually turning it and it, and it feels like it's coming feels like it's it's going to turn and we're going to get this apart we're going to make this occulting eyepiece and then we hear the glass start to kind of <laughs> oh no and i was like oh that's bad so anyway yeah so we end up you know basically the eyepiece is now squished and uh we're like okay so uh let's just crush so we completely crushed the eyepiece <laughs> it just threw it away. I literally had this strange feeling of going up to my friend's motorcycle shop to make an occulting eyepiece and leaving without the eyepiece. And the eyepiece was in the trash, like completely flat. Right? Oh no! So anyway, so um, yeah, it would be great if you could if you could buy a kit or get because you know you don't need it to be like your best eyepiece in the set. It'd be great to have lots of like around 60 degree eyepieces these days. It'd be great if somebody just made a kit or, or would produce an occulting eyepiece so that you could kind of go and, and make these, uh, and make these observations. But, uh, but yeah, we, we didn't successfully do it. I think we even tried um, another eyepiece on a different occasion um, that he had. And it, he, yeah, we, we had some trouble like getting it to work just the way we wanted it. And then it was the wrong focal length thing. It was too low power. Then we get into using Barlow's and well, now we're back full circle to talking to Barlow. So, <laughs> okay. Do you have anything else to add to this podcast, Shane? Uh, not really. Uh, just again, excited for Venus and uh, you know, a little DIY or D you know, DIY project of uh, trying to come up with some sort of occulting filter bar eyepiece accessory. Maybe we can make a filter eyepiece Barlow a coulter <laughs> that's four feet long. All right. Yeah. Yeah.
Sounds, sounds good. Okay. Thank you very much for listening to episode eight of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. This podcast has been brought to you by the Occulting Eyepiece. Why don't they exist? Dear eyepiece manufacturers, please make us an occulting eyepiece. Thank you for listening.